So welcome everyone to the fourth in the series of anniversary lectures celebrating 20 years of the MRI Coordination Office in Bern, Switzerland. My name is Gabrielle Vance. I'm a scientific project officer there organizing the series. And our goal with the series is to celebrate the 20th anniversary and also to showcase MRI supported and led research and build capacity in the mountain research community. Today, we have a really exciting lecture, and I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, James Thornton, who is also a scientific project officer at the MRI Coordination Office, focused on geo mountains, which I'm sure you will hear much more about from James, but is an initiative of the group on Earth Observations that's focused on improving access to data relevant to mountain environments worldwide. You know, that we are recording this meeting to share with anyone who wasn't able to join live. So please keep that in mind in terms of turning your video on and off. And we'll have a lecture from James and then um, plenty of time for questions and answers after that, including some questions and even a survey that James has for you. So questions going in both directions. If you have a question at any point during the event today, please feel free to write it in the chat. Um, I think in a meeting, you also have the ability to raise your hand if you have a question. And then during the Q&A part, we'll welcome you to turn on your camera, turn on your audio if you feel comfortable doing so. So thank you all so much again. And um, I think we're all really excited to hear from James on the progress toward a definition of EMCBs. So thank you. Go ahead, James. Thank you very much indeed, Gabrielle. And uh, many thanks from my side for, to everybody for joining. Um, it's a real privilege to have been invited to give this lecture. Um, and happy 20th birthday to the MRI. Begin very briefly by just adding a word or two of a personal, um, personal introduction. Uh, just to say that I consider myself to be an interdisciplinary but hydrologically focused environmental scientist, trying really as far as possible to do both fieldwork and modeling. Not always difficult, and uh, certainly of late, I've been doing more of the latter. But I think having this balance can be can be very productive and useful. Um, I've been for over a year now the coordinator of Geo Mountains, which, which as Gabrielle mentioned, um, is our initiative on the uh, of the group on Earth Observations, which is really seeking to to improve the discoverability, accessibility, and usability of a really wide range of data pertaining to mountainous environments worldwide. Um, prior to that, my background's in um, hydrogeology. Um, I obtained my PhD in 2020 from the University of Neuchatel, and I've also have some experience working in the private sector uh, modeling natural catastrophe risk. Um, I must also begin by making some very important acknowledgements. Firstly, to all the co-authors who contributed to our recent paper um, on this topic. Uh, this was published earlier in the year. In particular, Nick Pepin, Elisa Palatti, and Caroline Adler, who organized the workshop in 2019 from which the paper grew. I um, should also thank uh, sincerely the other workshop participants for their valuable contributions. I believe this photograph here um, shows all those who are in attendance. Um, and the funding for the workshop and also for the open access publication was kindly provided by the European Space Agency and the Future Earth Joint Programme. I should finally thank my former colleagues from the Universities of Neuchatel and Lausanne for also helping to shape uh, some of the ideas uh, which I'll present today. Um, this is the outline of my talk. Naturally enough, I'll begin with some words on the nature of the challenge or what is motivating us um, to do this before introducing our proposed solution, the identification of a set of so-called essential mountain climate variables, or EMCVs for short. Um, I'll then pr progress to provide a few examples of ways in which we could perhaps better measure or derive some of these variables or else exploit existing data sets more fully. Uh, then drawing on some of my previous research, We'll look in particular at how combining a variety of observational data sets with numerical models in particular can really help us to characterize mountainous systems in a more holistic fashion, um, helping to fill in the observational data gaps to a certain extent, and also providing a basis on which we can then make future projections. Um, after that, I'll set out a series of, of potential next steps, and this is really where uh, the help and guidance of the entire mountain uh, research community and others will come in. And so hopefully during the time of question and answer and discussion, we can um, begin to, 
to exchange views on some of these outstanding issues. And to that end, I've also prepared, as Gabrielle mentioned, a short survey, which we would like as many mountain stakeholders as possible to, to, to kindly complete. Um, this is researchers, policymakers, practitioners, and others who have an interest. Uh, so beginning with the challenge, uh, mountains, of course, cover a very considerable proportion of the global land surface and host many millions of people, uh, as well as a great deal of biodiversity. Um, and then also, of course, provide a very wide range of ecosystem goods and services to the adjacent lowlands. I found this figure online, which provides a fairly nice, if perhaps uh, slightly simplistic summary. Um, one could maybe even question some of the statistics. Uh, for instance, this um, uh, 60 to 80 percent of fresh water stored in glaciers. This is actually pretty much uh, quite a lot of this is at the poles. But there's, of course, a great deal of scientific uh, literature um, assessing the, the importance of, of mountains. Um, from, from a variety of perspectives, which of course can be consulted also, and some examples are just given here. Um, so why do we need um, informative data on the evolution of, of the climate and also climate dependent components of mountain systems, both uh, biotic and abiotic? Well, there are perhaps three primary reasons, and there's actually a kind of important thread tying them together in the sense that each step is actually dependent upon the previous ones. So the first reason is simply to track or monitor and then report on in a timely fashion uh, the state of play, so to speak. How are the drivers changing and how are the, the various systems responding? Secondly, uh, we have to develop improved conceptual or theoretical understanding of the various process mechanisms involved, um, which are actually bringing about these responses which, we, which we're observing. And thirdly, we have to, to look to the future and to develop more robust climate change impact projections. This could be, for instance, how the glaciers uh, might respond in future, as, as shown in this example here, under a variety of plausible future scenarios, but equally snowpacks, uh, various components of hydrological systems, uh, vegetation, um, and so forth. Uh, equally, we might be interested in looking to identify areas in which uh, the risks of natural hazards in mountains may increase. Um, and so such projections really have a, a very wide range of practical applications in terms of how do we manage the environment in a more optimal fashion? How can we mitigate natural risks? And how can we adapt to climate change? Uh, much of which, of course, is already uh, committed or inevitable. Um, however, there are various challenges uh, when it comes to obtaining informative data in mountains, as I'm sure many of you or probably all of you are aware of to, to some extent or another. Uh, firstly, the, the degree of system complexity is very high. We typically have many, many processes and also very diverse processes operating in a, in a close proximity to one another. And these processes, moreover, generally demonstrate quite a lot of spatial and temporal variability, uh, the spatial component of which is really largely driven by the complex topography, rugged topography, and also um, in many mountainous regions, the geology is also inherently complex as a, as a you know, due to the, to, the, to the mechanisms which by which the mountains were formed in the first place, essentially, and then have been molded over time. Um, and so, of course, there are also uh, many interactions and feedback mechanisms operating between all these different components. Uh, secondly, mountains are generally uh, fairly remote, and the conditions uh, therein can be very hot, inhospitable for both people and infrastructure. So this photograph here shows an example from, from my work uh, here in the Swiss Alps, where we had a, a meteorological station uh, raised four meters above the ground, and then we've had four meters of snow in the winter and everything is, is broken simply. Um, we also have had problems with uh, tracks being blocked due to avalanches, preventing us to get the equipment uh, up to where we need it, uh, and so on. Uh, in situ measurements are often uh, generally correspond to only point locations as well, and therefore have a limited spatial representativity, um, especially given the strong spatial gradients, which I mentioned earlier. And this actually means that when we seek to interpolate um, to produce spatially continuous data, um, the resultant uh, outputs can be uh, associated with, with quite high uncertainties. Um, there can also be some technical challenges, for instance, when we're trying to measure precipitation, uh, particularly solid precipitation in windy conditions, we, we don't do a very good job of it. Um, put simply, uh, there's severe underestimation, uh, which can be very hard to correct for due to this problem of gauge undercatch. Um, of course, over the recent uh, few decades, we've had really amazing advances in remote sensing. 
which have really greatly improved the situation for many, many types of measurements. So this is extremely positive development. Um, however, remote sensing doesn't yet perhaps uh, provide the, the total solution in mountains, maybe never will. So for instance, if we're doing optical remote sensing, we often have problems with shadows from the topography and, and clouds it can be very common, of course, in mountains. Uh, if we're flying UAVs and drones around, uh, we can sometimes lose the, the GPS signal needing to keep them on course due to the, to the surrounding topography. Um, when we're looking to measure uh, precipitation using radar, we can have some sort of blind spots uh, caused by the, the complex terrain. And for, for many variables, uh, including some very important ones, uh, such as groundwater levels and permafrost conditions, we really still need to, to use invasive methods. We have to go there, drill, uh, and actually see what's going on um, in the field. So con consequently, the, the quantity and informativeness of, of climate and climate dependent um, observations in mountainous areas is often lower than elsewhere. And in addition, the sort of data landscape can be very heterogeneous. Uh, we have lots of different measurements being made by many different groups of, and organizations using a variety of different approaches. Um, and this means that at the global level, there's really not much consistency, interoperability, or intercomparability um, between data sets corresponding to, to the mountains. Um, of course, everybody's constrained by uh, finite resources, and so we have to prioritize in one way or another. Um, and yet, uh, there's really not so much interdisciplinary consensus yet about precisely which variables we should be focusing on or prioritizing, how they should be measured for, for general or common reporting and scientific applications in mountains at a global scale. And so this is really the um, the nub of the problem which, which our work hopes to address uh, here today. So moving on then to our proposed solution, um, the concept of essential climate variables, ECVs, has been established by the Global Climate Observing System, GCOS, for many, many years now. And this has really provided a, a very good focal point around which the Earth observation community globally has coalesced and focused their efforts. Um, and generated more standard uh, data sets. However, it's clear that some of the variables listed here by GCOS uh, have very little direct relevance to the mountains. Of course, they can be important in the wider Earth system, but we're talking now about direct relevance to the mountains, particularly some of these variables um, related to the oceans, for instance. Others might actually be relevant also in the mountains, but the measurement attributes or standards which, which these measurements would have to meet, be meet would have to meet in order to be uh, useful for general applications in mountains would generally be very different. So for instance, higher spatial resolution uh, would often be required to capture this variability, which I mentioned earlier. And therefore we propose a new framework specifically for mountains, which is inspired by GCOS, but is not necessarily constrained to the existing philosophy and scope. And so on this basis, we propose a definition of essential mountain climate variables um, as follows, physical, chemical, or biological variables that either currently do or potentially could significantly contribute to the characterization of the Earth's mountainous environmental systems, especially under change. So in this sense, we maintain GCOS's very broad definition of, of climate, in the sense that we're not only talking about climatological and meteorological variables, but also um, observations of, of components which are influenced to some extent by climate or, or climate change impacts across mountain systems more generally. Um, we also relax or refocus some of the GCOS requirements. So for instance, in the established ECV framework, um, considerable emphasis is placed on remote sensing. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, and here we, we need to recognize the crucial importance of in situ observations and so consider both on an equal basis. Somewhat similarly to be listed as, as an ECV, measurements must be technically feasible and cost-effective right now. But we actually take a, a more aspirational view, um, seeking to establish rather what we, would we like uh, or what do we need rather than just what can we get at the moment. And so taking this philosophy could actually spur advances in measurement um, technologies and also uh, retrieval technologies from, from satellites. Likewise, we actually relax or propose to relax the constraint um, that these um, 
variables are, are directly measurable also for direct empiricalism. Recognizing the fact that the mountains in particular, um, often no single measurement technique can tell us everything we need to know. And that actually often by integrating all the relevant data with numerical models can, can provide actually a very good way forward. And therefore we propose that our EMCV concept also integrates modeled data, model outputs. Uh, but these are really all just initial proposals as we put forth and certainly to be further discussed and shaped uh, by the mountain research community. Um, another important question, and this is another aspect in which we don't necessarily have a very firm view yet, that is of parsimony versus utility. So put simply, if we define an extremely short or exclusive set of EC EMCVs, then it could be possible to obtain the actual uh, measurements of these uh, fairly easily in a practical sense, you know, we don't have too many to measure. Um, however, the number of applications to which such observations could be useful might actually be limited especially given the complexity of the, the systems involved. On the other hand, if we uh, define a very long list, um, these observations would be inherently more challenging to obtain, but they could be useful for a wider range of applications. And so clearly a balance somewhere is required between these uh, competing extremes. Before we move on to consider the actual variables themselves, um, we have to identify what the most important components and processes uh, typical of mountain systems actually are, again, focusing on, on uh, under change, under climatic change conditions. So to do this, we considered four key components or spheres in turn, the atmosphere, cryosphere, biosphere, and hydrosphere, uh, whilst also trying to, to focus as much as possible on the, the many links between them. At the same time, not neglecting the role of uh, the lithosphere, um, and also the very complex topography, which we can really consider as underpinning these systems on a fundamental level. So for instance, uh, for the atmosphere, we discussed uh, and drew attention to aspects such as, of course, the global uh, greenhouse gas forcing, but more locally in terms of mountains, um, aspects such as the deposition of, of aerosols like um, um, black carbon on the cryosphere and how this can influence the surface albedo and therefore the melt and the, the hydrosphere downstream um, and also uh, the effects of tropospheric ozone and how this can affect uh, not only human health in mountains but also vegetation uh, growth and productivity. For the cryosphere, that is the snow, glaciers, lake ice and permafrost, um, this is of course heavily controlled by the atmospheric conditions or the climatic conditions and in turn exerts a strong influence on the hydrosphere. Um, generally speaking, cryosphere in the mountains worldwide is declining rapidly in both extent and mass. And also cryospheric risks such as glacial lake outburst floods, rock falls related to permafrost degradation and avalanches as snow uh, conditions change are increasing in many regions. In terms of the biosphere, we have tree lines and grass lines which are rising up the mountains, so a general greening of higher elevations in many regions, um, increases in species richnesses on mountain summits, and of course um, the problem that species which are adapted to cold conditions may have nowhere to go. There are also some important direct anthropogenic impacts, such as pasture abandonment, which we're seeing quite widely, for instance, in the European Alps, uh, which can lead to, to actually forest colonizing previously open pastures. And this can complicate a bit our understanding of what is driving vegetation change. Um, but this is not actually our main focus here. We're focusing more for the time being, at least on more of the biophysical systems. And finally, the biosphere, of course, exerts important influences on the other spheres via evapotranspiration um, and its impact on the surface energy balance amongst, other, amongst others. Finally, in the hydrosphere, um, we know that uh, the stream discharge at the catchment outlet really integrates all the changes in the upstream system and so responses to external change can be rather subtle and complex, but um, in light of changing uh, ratios of, of rain to snow, or snow to rain, uh, snow patterns more generally, um, glacier and melt contributions, permafrost conditions, these can all affect um, the internal hydrological functioning of mountain catchments and therefore ultimately um, stream flow. And in many cases, actually, these changes are already detectable. So we're seeing shifts in streamflow timing and magnitude, and also uh, water temperatures, actually, as well. 
I want to sort of put, put a particular emphasis on mountain groundwater, the importance of mountain groundwater, in particular its role in sustaining stream flows during dry uh, periods or when snow melt and ice melt contributions are low, uh, which is crucial, of course, for aquatic ecosystems, and then also the role um, of, of hydrology more generally in feedbacks with the other components. So for instance, it's been shown that uh, soil and groundwater conditions on the one hand and vegetation on the other actually develop in a co-dependent fashion over time, so they both sort of influence the other, so to speak. And so following this review, and there's a bit more detail in the paper, we could actually develop and agree, agree on a kind of conceptual model of a generic integrated mountain system. And that's what this diagram here seeks to, to summarize or represent. And actually looking through the literature, we realized that uh, perhaps surprisingly, no such figure had actually been uh, presented previously. So, so it was sort of left to me to have a go at drawing one and in the end, I sort of dusted off my art skills from my limited art skills from I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago and managed to come up with something uh, more or less reasonable, I hope. Um, so this really provides an interdisciplinary or integrated summary of some of these most important aspects and processes. Having done this, uh, we could then proceed to develop a single ranking of, of variables associated with these various components and processes according to their perceived importance um, in an interdisciplinary way. And so this process began at the workshop with a great deal of discussion and debate amongst the participants who were coming from, from uh, many different perspectives and disciplines and, and um, years of experience. And then of course, there was also some work required to refine this uh, ranking subsequently. So this slide shows the results uh, in the form of a word cloud, whereby the, the size of the terms is proportional to the ranking which was assigned. So at the moment, there are 97 such potential or candidate EMCVs, although, as mentioned earlier, one may not necessarily want the final set to be so extensive. However, at a fundamental level, it does suggest that um, we need actually many variables or a large number of variables to characterize mountain systems in, in a kind of basic way, which is not really surprising considering the complexity of the systems. Um, and naturally enough, um, variables which are important to several spheres, such as air temperature and precipitation, or which else link various spheres, such as those variables um, which affect the surface energy balance, like the surface albedo and land cover, naturally feature prominently. In other words, are ranked highly. Um, another kind of very interesting and perhaps important outcome is that we identified several new or non GCOS variables. Um, which could actually be considered perhaps uniquely important in mountains. And so these are listed here in the table on the left. Many of them are, are more specific to, to mountains. So for instance, uh, splitting up um, latent heat flux into the component of that, which is rapid transpiration versus uh, direct sublimation of snow. So from directly from solid to, to gaseous phase, um, information on the snow microstructure, which can help inform um, efforts to, for instance, derive snow water equivalent by remote sensing, um, more localized information on the uh, debris cover, cover on glaciers, which can affect the surface energy balance and therefore melt patterns, information on how vegetation can be um, affected or disturbed by avalanches, rockfalls, and so forth, some more specific information on groundwater dynamics, species abundances, etc. Um, some derived variables were also proposed, of course, in mountains, we're often very interested to understand a bit more um, temperature lap lapse rates or really in three dimensions, actually, rather than just two. So the um, changes in, in temperature with elevation um, on a per event or per seasonal basis. Um, I think this list also demonstrates that, um, that we put in greater emphasis on in situ data, there are many variables here which can only really be measured in situ and therefore could perhaps have been overlooked slightly by GCOS, given the general greater emphasis they place on uh, remote sensing. And I also uh, think it's important to, to emphasize really the, the importance of characterizing the topography in mountains as well. There's hardly really a mountain study where it's not important to, to integrate um, digital terrain models, um, data on slope aspects, uh, gradients and so forth. So this is really another important aspect which comes out of our work. Uh, and likewise, also emphasizing uh, extremes uh, of, of various um, 
variables um, in view of natural hazards as well. There's also a bit of emphasis on this. So in the paper, we talk actually quite a bit about various established ways or common ways to measure many of these variables, both on this list and, and more generally. Uh, I don't want to dwell too much on that for now, but rather move on to talk about um, how we can actually um, perhaps better um, measure or exploit or derive climate-related data in mountains using some emerging technologies as well um, and approaches. So one important way we feel is to develop new and also to expand existing interdisciplinary mountain observatories and networks. So Sonnenblick uh, in Austria, which is shown here in this figure, could provide an excellent example or model here, uh, whereby you have a central station surrounded by actually um, distributed network of sites measuring many different aspects of, of the systems, uh, glaciers, permafrost, vegetation, and so forth. And so certainly intensively monitored experimental catchments would also fall within this category. As I alluded to earlier, at present, um, many mountainous uh, measurements across a wide range of disciplines are made uh, by relatively small research in institutes and programs rather than global networks. So a good overview of who's measuring what, how and why, which is actually required to optimize future efforts is pretty tricky. And so we recently developed this uh, in situ inventory, uh, which is available on the Geo Mountains website and which provides a really show where uh, these sites are and also provides links to the actual data as we're seeing here in this animation. We've actually recently invited contributions from the community to help populate this resource. So to add um, missing sites and to also add information about sites which are already existing, what's being measured, using which methods, over what time periods and so forth. And at the moment, um, in Geo Mountains, we're also developing a similar inventory for remotely sensed data sets. And we hope that at some point it will be possible to sit down and identify a global network of mountain sites that are rich in both in situ and remote observations for a range of variables, not only biophysical, but also socioeconomic. And we can classify these as, or call them mountain observatories. And this idea has been outlined in the paper here, uh, which was led by the MRI Mountain Observatories Working Group. And so this is really a bit the, uh, the, end, the end game, um, so to speak. And we can see where we might need to, to augment observational uh, capabilities um, by doing this, but really we also need to populate these inventories first to be able to do that. And so yeah, the, uh, the inventory provides a lot of functionality at the moment for searching for individual places uh, or sites. It really just hopes to also ease this flow of data as well. Um, links to papers, for instance, where data sets are, are described um, and so forth. Um, also, coupled with that, there's a wealth of remotely sensed data that can certainly be better exploited. One way this can be done is to ingest the, the observations into data cubes, which provide pre-processed and analysis-ready um, remote sensing images through time. So this slide here shows uh, an application of the Swiss data cube to quantify snow cover changes through time uh, at the national level. Um, and there's also um, many options to actually combine the latest high resolution uh, remotely sensed data from Sentinel, for instance, the Sentinel program, which is only available for the, for the last few years, with actually uh, much coarser uh, catalogs, but which go back longer in time. And if we can intelligently um, combine these two, then we can, in theory, generate higher resolution catalogs um, over the longer term, respect, uh, retrospectively. So this could be also another um, nice approach. Likewise, um, climate model reanalyses and future projections are constantly improving. For instance, in the Himalayan region, we have a fairly new reanalysis product now called HAR version two. And we can see on this figure that compared with the, the previous, uh, previous uh, product, um, this, this new product better captures the, the effects of topography on uh, mean summer air temperatures. So that's what, the, that's what we, the variable which is plotted here on the map. And we can also see that we can match in situ measurements uh, quite well now. So really we're seeing an improved representation of the, the topography and the influence this has on 
on the climate and uh, land surface uh, processes and interactions as well. So this is definitely going in the, the right direction. Likewise, in terms of future climate scenarios, um, we now have available increasingly uh, locally downscaled and fully transient data, such as in Switzerland, we have the CH2018 um, scenarios. And this approach, as well as providing information on the spatial scales at which impacts of climate change are really felt, um, which are very, very local, if I'm not, not mistaken, I think um, this product provides information at one kilometer resolution. Um, the method, the underlying method is also based, is also this transient approach and therefore it overcomes many of the limitations associated with the, the previous more simplistic delta change method where we're just um, keeping the, the frequencies of historical um, events the same, but just sort of shifting the whole distribution. So this is also uh, promising and hopefully some of this these advancements which are being made can also be, be transferred to, to other mountain regions around the world. Um, the integration of remotely sensed data and in situ data with numerical models is really another rapidly growing field. And this enables the generation of spatially and temporally complete data or model outputs, which actually ex can extract the maximal information from the often complementary data available. So often in situ measurements have complete time series between the individual points where satellite remote sensing often provides a complete spatial picture, but only for intermittent uh, days. So there are a few different approaches which can be, which can be taken here. Uh, inverse modeling uh, or calibration and data assimilation are perhaps the most common ones. Here, I'd like to present a couple of brief examples from my own work. Uh, the first case involves uh, distributed snow modeling in an alpine catchment here in Switzerland to obtain patterns of meltwater arrival at the land surface. And the rationale really is that in sparsely gauged and topographically complex terrain, the meteorological forcings, which are required by such models, are often highly uncertain for the reasons which I, I mentioned earlier. And in addition, uh, many hydrologically important processes, such as the gravitational redistribution of snow from the steep slopes, uh, can't actually be represented at catchment or larger scales uh, using physically-based algorithms. So it's often appropriate to incorporate in empirical parameters into otherwise physically-based snow models. So um, in this case, I developed a catalog of snow extent maps um, and also reconstructed some snow water equivalent time series at two sites and use these to constrain or to calibrate several uncertain model parameters, including those related to the uh, corrections which are needed to account for this undercatch problem and also the slope angles which control um, under what conditions snow can, can be redistributed gravitationally. And so essentially this involves modifying the parameters within reasonable bounds, um, running the models uh, many times and seeking to minimize the mismatch between the total mismatch between simulations and observations. And so a particularly novel aspect of this work was that the spatial component of the objective function was computed on a per pixel level. So for each simulation, for each day we were trying to match on a per pixel level whether snow presence or absence was being uh, simulated correctly or not and then aggregating those statistics up and combining them with the, the temporal matches as well and so in terms of the spatial outputs uh, looking here at the, the true color composite image for a few selected days on the left hand side the snow the binary snow map which was derived and then the model simulated snow water equivalent distribution on the right hand side we can see that uh, generally quite good matches were, were obtained for a range of different snow cover conditions. So just cycling through these, and likewise, we can reproduce the snow water equivalent time series at station locations reasonably well. Um, it should be mentioned really that uh, many of the meteorological variables were not measured at these sites precisely, so there's also a bit of an interpolation uh, error which could affect the, the quality of these simulations, but at, at least at a fundamental level, we really see the difference between the uh, high elevation site where we have this uh, continual accumulation and um, ablation of the snowpack compared to a much lower elevation site on the right here where we have a much more intermittent snowpack. And so having a model of course allows us to then uh, yeah, fill the gaps in space and time and we can look at an animation here on the left of this uh, snow water equivalent evolution through a complete winter period. Uh, this was the very, very snowy winter of 20. Um, 1718, and we see actually this gravitational redistribution from the very steep slopes 
on the accumulations at the base of the cliffs here. And this really corresponds very well with our experience from the field during the same period. And so this is important to represent because it of course affects when and where meltwater arrives at the land surface um, and therefore um, any hydrological applications uh, thereafter. And by introducing additional uh, data, for instance, on unconsolidated and uh, co consolidated or bedrock geology, soil properties, uh, land cover, uh, and defining a, a numerical mesh and so forth, we can actually um, employ a sophisticated integrated hydrological model to take this all to the next step and simulate the remainder of the hydrological cycle in a very holistic sense, explicitly in space and time, according to physical principles. So more specifically, uh, simulating three-dimensional variably saturated groundwater flow, two-dimensional surface water flow, evapotranspiration, and also the free bidirectional exchanges between groundwater and surface water. So in such simulations, surface water network is essentially free to emerge and evolve naturally and doesn't have to be imposed uh, beforehand as in many uh, hydrological modeling approaches. So we can uh, discretize these equations using control volume finite element approach um, and then solve the surface and subsurface um, equations simultaneously um, by employing a, a shared or a common term, that is the exchange flux, um, using some advanced numerical methods with adaptive time stepping. And so overall, such models are really a lot more powerful than the traditional bucket type hydrological models that are routinely used for hydrological climate change impact projections or assessments in mountains. However, they do really need a lot of data, both to build them or to inform them, but then also to calibrate and evaluate them. A nice uh, thing when we have this data is that we're not constrained to calibrating uh, solely against stream flow at the catchment outlet, but we can actually include internal groundwater level measurements, soil moisture data, evapotranspiration estimates, uh, exchange fluxes, basically anything that we can measure and the model also simulates at any point in space and time in the domain. Or we can also, of course, integrate data in time and space um, if, if that is best to make the comparisons with the, the available data. And so when we can pull this off, we can really synthesize and incorporate a large uh, range or a large number of our potential EMCVs into a single framework. So here we're looking at an animation um, at a half daily time step um, of, of the main meteorological boundary conditions. So all rain and, and melt arriving at the land surface in the top left and the potential of evapotranspiration or the atmospheric demand here in the top right. And we're starting sort of in the middle of winter and then the, um, the spring snow melt period will sort of uh, begin shortly. And then here on the bottom, we're looking at two important simulated response variables, surface water network, uh, the, the depth of the, the stream network, and also the actual evapotranspiration as well. And what we see is that as the snow melt um, onsets and moves to progressively higher elevations, um, the stream network also begins to expand, really, as we see um, in the reality as well. Evapotranspiration. Uh, of course, we see a strong eleva uh, elevational influence um, there as well, and also um, influence of, of vegetation properties as well, where we have forests in the lower part compared to where we have uh, more barren surfaces or grasses in the upper part as well. Essentially, the atmospheric demand can't be met um, by the actual evapotranspiration. Um, and so likewise, we can look at the subsurface as well, which is, of course, represented in 3D. And here we're looking at the uh, surface, the saturation at the surface, but also in the subsurface using these slices, and also the, the simulated um, evolution of surface water depth at the main gauging station. That's located approximately where my pointer is here. And again, we see that as the, during the recession period, everything's sort of draining out. And then as the, the snow melt onsets, uh, saturation levels at the surface and also in the subsurface increase and we get our, our peak um, in the stream flow as well. So I'll just let that to run uh, for a little while as well. And by looking at these animations, we can also help understand perhaps areas in which the numerical re representation can still be deficient or, or where we need more data um, and really understand uh, these systems in a more conceptual way. Do they make sense um, and, and simulate everything really um, in space and time? So here we're seeing the saturation is generally um, increased. And we see actually also the influence of the various complex geologies which are integrated here 
by a three-dimensional geological model um, because we have a complex sequence of, of limestones which are fairly permeable and, and marls and shales which are less so and therefore really constrain the, the groundwater flow patterns. Coming towards the end now, a um, few final uh, slides we can course, compare after calibration with the observation. So looking here at stream flow um, at, the, at the main gauging station, and we see that when we use hourly forcing data, we can reproduce these diurnal cycles or fluctuations, which can be very important for biogeochemical processes in the stream and in the riparian zone. And we can likewise, of course, um, see to what extent we can reproduce um, groundwater levels, which can be affected by local heterogeneities. But nevertheless, we see this um, strong seasonal cycle, and this can generally be, be reproduced by the models all the time building confidence in the numerical representation. And so just to add that one could then go uh, forward and apply future climate scenarios uh, and generate hopefully more reliable uh, predictions by incorporating all this spatial and temporal variability in, in surface and subsurface properties and processes and their interactions than, than lumping everything together using a simple uh, box model. Um, in particular, we can look at spatial change impact. So for instance, look not only at the direct hydrological impacts of climate change, but also the indirect ones. So we can see to what extent if the vegetation uh, expands uh, up the mountain slopes, as is shown in this uh, simulation here, a vegetation simulation, we can explore to what extent that could modulate the direct climate change impacts through snit changing rainfall, temperature, snow patterns, and so forth. So we can start to unpick some of these subtle complexities, which can be important. So in terms of the, the next steps and returning to our, our EMCVs more directly, I think there's still a few outstanding questions about the philosophy of, of the approach we should take. Um, I think we're, we're making quite good progress, but in particular, this question of parsimony versus you know, you know, how, how exclusive should our list be? Then we want to um, really conduct a wider survey, and that's really the start of the survey, which I'll present uh, very briefly, um, really recognizing the fact that everything I presented so far is really based on the experiences and the, um, the expertise of the people who are at the workshop and, and our own thoughts, and, may, and other people could have different views, and so I really want to, to open the survey up and uh, do something a bit more representative of the community as a whole. Another really crucial task will be to actually define very carefully the minimum observational requirements which we would like these variables to meet. So for instance, how, how highly resolved in space do, do snow maps need to be? How frequently do we need to be measuring X, Y, and Z, and so forth? Um, that's going to be ch challenging and, and a lot of work. And then from that point, we can then assess to what extent our requirements can be met by, by existing data sets and data sources using our inventories and other, other information which is out there. And then hopefully we can ultimately work together to, to fill the gaps and to, to close the gaps between what we want and what, what we have. And so with that, I think I'll move on to the conclusions. Uh, so in summary, we propose this concept as a framework that could contribute to the increased availability of more standardized and interoperable climate data across the world's mountains. Uh, we've developed this preliminary ranking, but further debate and discussion are required, especially around this, this question of observational standards, which should be met um, for the observations to be useful for a wide range of generic applications. Of course, we're not trying to, to generate a set of variables which will be uh, sufficient for every single application, no matter how specific. And uh, in particular, thirdly, that we feel that the intelligent combination of, of models with a broad range of observational data can really provide a good way forward to characterize these systems more comprehensively and also develop um, useful uh, future projections. And so just as an aside, we're also working on a similar set of variables, which are concerned more specifically with mountain biodiversity monitoring. And also we hope to replicate the exercise starting with the workshop for social and economic variables, which should also be uh, monitored um, in mountains as well. So moving towards an even more integrated socio-economic, uh, you know, integrating really the environmental and the um, social and economic components of these systems more, more closely. And on, on that note, we're also working on a, pop, a study on mountain population distributions and their drivers, which 
which will also come, come out hopefully towards the end of the year as well. So ultimately, we may even end up with a single integrated set of simply essential mountain variables. We shall see. Um, so thank you very much for listening, and we'd be happy to um, answer any questions or discuss the concept more generally, either now um, or later. And um, there's the link to the survey um, there. And I think Gabrielle will kindly circulate the slides so, and the recording so that um, yeah, the survey can be accessed. Um, but for now, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, James. Um, I did just send the link to the survey in the chat for everyone. So um, I'm sure you have questions for James, but uh, the Q&A is bi-directional. So please feel free to check that out and share it. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask now, you have a couple of options depending on which version of Zoom. For the chat, there is um, usually along the bottom of your screen, you'll see a speech bubble and you can click on that to use the chat. Under reactions, which is a little smiley face, at least for me, you have the option to raise your hand. You can also just turn on your audio and or video if you like. One question that came in in the chat already was from Hasib about some of the sources for the advanced numerical models, James. Yeah, sources. I mean, um, I guess the, the question is what what kind of codes are available? Is that, is that a bit of the question? I mean, there's a- Yes, really could you please provide the sources for advanced numerical models? Yeah, I mean, there's a wide range of, of codes available, many of which are, are open source um, and they're generally focused by discipline. You know? So, I mean, for instance, um, at, the, at the SLF here in Switzerland, they have um, you know, extremely advanced um, codes for monitoring, uh, for modeling rather snowpack processes in great de detail, which are openly accessible. Um, there are uh, integrated models such as the one which I presented. Um, another alternative which is open is called Parflow, uh, which does something similar to the to the integrated surface water ground water modeling, which I described. Generally, I think all the reanalyses, data sets and things are generally um, accessible. So really this is yeah, definitely also something we hope to um, help improve with our inventories actually is, is listing um, for given applications what actually are the codes which are available um, so that then hopefully users can find uh, suitable simulation approaches more, more efficiently as well as the data sets which are needed. Um, so yeah, that's a really important point and I think definitely we're seeing a, a positive trend in the, the availability of quite advanced uh, open source codes and of course more simplistic empirical based models are still have their applications especially for, for more practical sort of applications but when we want to unpick some of these complex process interactions having something a bit more physically based um, representing the important variability is um, is important you know i think um, yeah as simple as necessary but as simple as possible but no simpler i think is mm -hmm. the, the mantra mm -hmm. definitely thank you so Hasib, I hope that answered your question. If not, please feel free to write in the chat, raise your hand or unmute and follow up. Are there any other questions from the audience? I know our MRI chair, Jörg, is here. Perhaps Jörg has a question or anyone else? Yeah, if you have a question, feel free just to just to speak up, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can unmute or if you're having trouble unmuting, let us know. Um, I saw that Sven mentioned the um, in the chat, Sven wrote that for the CH 2018 scenarios, Sven, you wrote two kilometers in station scale. Would you like to expand on that comment? Um, yes, uh, so it's, it's just some, because uh, I think James wasn't quite sure what's the scale at which we then provide these scenarios. So it's, it's two, two kilometer and station scale for the, for the case of Switzerland. And indeed, I mean, there's a lot of statistics involved because these scales are still poorly represented by, by physical models. So we actually re strongly rely on statistics that are trained um, using observations, of course, also. So this is very relevant also. So the mountain observations in general are very relevant for producing climate scenarios in mountain regions. 
that are uh, important for assessing potential impacts of climate change in the future, for instance. So it's it's a very relevant thing here. Thanks, James. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for this great station. I couldn't remember if it was two or one kilometers, but in any case, yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> matter. matter. Just to, to point out, it's very important what, what you did. Yeah, yeah, and I think the real the, the real challenge is closing this scale mismatch between, as Sven said, the scales at which climate models are run, even regional climate models, are dynamically downscaled uh, models, and the actual scale of impacts. You know, if we're looking at a little catchment and we're seeking to, to better quantify flood risk or or whatever, we actually need uh, you know, much more localized information. And as Fen says, uh, making this bridge using using observations can really help as well to in this downscaling effort. Thank you for that. Another discussion in the chat, Blanca had asked about the link. Um, so uh, Sergio shared the link to the Geo Mountains in situ inventory. Thank you. I hope everyone will check that out and consider submitting to that or the inventory of um, remotely sensed resources. And then also to Blanca's point, um, until when will the EMCV survey be open? James, I assume it's open ended, but I don't I know think, if you have a fixed. Yeah, I mean, I think we could um, we can leave people a few weeks, perhaps even a month to I mean, there's no super time pressure to, to look at it. But I mean, yeah, the idea is really just to survey a bit more widely the, the community. So on that note, mm -hmm. please do circulate it amongst your networks, uh, anybody who you think could have views on this as well, and um, to see if we've missed anything important or if there's um, other disciplines which have been sort of overlooked inadvertently and, and so forth, really to make sure that, um, yeah, this approach is, is as um, community led as possible, I suppose. Yeah, thank you. And so Blanca, it, at least a month more, but I would encourage everyone to do it and share it today because surveys have a way of, um, it's easy to uh, forget to fill them out. If, oh, I'll do that later. But it'll be really add, helpful to get your input. Yeah, um, just, Ash just complimented. Add, add, sorry, Gabriel, just to add, it is extremely short, so it won't take much of your time. And uh, these more intensive processes like defining the observation requirements, this will be done offline. I'm not it's not a it's not a very onerous survey sorry go ahead yes it's quite brief sure um ash complimented your hand drawn mountain figure i'm a big fan of that one too and asks if uh, there's a vision for integrating ecological data in the mountain database i assume um maybe that means the inventory or perhaps the variables but um yeah i mean um throughout geo mountains um more generally and and i think um as i've described today i think um data on on ecosystems and the biosphere and biodiversity certainly has a, a central place i hope that came across but yeah certainly certainly very 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 important um maybe just touch on the uh i mentioned that we're doing a similar effort on uh, biodiversity variable specifically and the rationale here is that um, often the requirements there are even more uh, specific or focused just on that that particular aspect of monitoring um, mountain biodiversity so that's a slight that's almost like a slightly separate separate aspect but at, a, at an overall level of course yeah we're considering atmosphere cryosphere hydrosphere biosphere the impact of complex topography and enough on complex geology as well um, and also the yeah, human um, systems within within these environments, so people who live there, vulnerabilities, um, demographic factors, um, structures, transport links, education, health. Um, this really is all all included. We're a very broad um, we have a very broad concept of, of mountain systems, and we're trying to be as inclusive as possible. Thank you. Uh, perhaps a related question. Jörg was wondering from a political science perspective, how can decision makers help foster the use of EMCVs? Yeah, I think um, definitely one side would be through contributing to such surveys, actually telling us uh, or telling um, organizations such as Geo Mountains and the MRI who are seeking to, um, to develop these efforts, who may have closer links perhaps with the, the research community and the research needs, but I think it's equally important that decision makers on the ground, environmental managers, uh, and so forth, actually also contribute and tell us what they need. And these requirements might be slightly different. 
Um, for instance, if, if you're in charge of making some decisions um, about, I don't know, mitigating flood risk, you might um, require forecasts on very short lead times to be able to, to yeah, um, evacuate people or, or so forth. So um, those requirements could actually be different. And I think the dialogue is, is very important um, because unless we know what the requirements are, then we can't necessarily target our framework to meet them. Um, I think that would be my main main response at the moment um, in response to that question. I hope it answered it. If not, then uh, feel free to follow up. So Kurt was asking about Swiss institutional financial support for the network of mountain observatories. Um, and Sven shared that GCOS Switzerland ex um, supports this network to some extent. Are there other institutions you're aware of? Yeah. I think the main um, institutions, and I probably should have mentioned them more explicitly, is Geo Mountains is heavily funded by the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, uh, which is a federal agency under their Adaptation at Altitude program. And this is specifically focusing on adaptation to climate change in mountain regions uh, around the world. Um, and um, we're sort of focusing on the data side, but, but other organizations are focusing more on this, this chain from uh, data to information to, to adaptation actions. So that, that's a, a very important um, Swiss organization, which is providing substantial help in this whole area. The other one I think is, um, even though not Swiss, but of course based in Switzerland, the WMO, World Meteorological Organization, um, which, which is of course closely linked to, to GCOS as well. But for instance, um, they have some financing mechanisms which can help, um, for instance, improve in situ um, meteorological and climatological data coverage and, and hydrological data coverage indeed uh, around the world as well. But actually to, to demonstrate to, to, to such organizations where um, these schemes are needed or would be most beneficial, we actually need to have a holistic view of what is there at the moment um, to identify where the, the main gaps lie at the moment. In our in-situ inventory, for instance, we don't know if a gap on the map is simply that there's no station there, or actually there is a station, but it's just not in our database yet. And so that's why I really urge uh, the whole community, the diverse community, to contribute their sites to that. And then we can see not only spatially, but also by discipline, also potentially by elevation or by time period, where the main gaps are, and then make much more convincing cases to, to such organizations who have the resources to help. Um, but because at the moment the mountain data landscape is so heterogeneous, um, we can't just go to a single source and get a complete database which shows where, where all the measurements are made. And so that's a bit what we're trying to do um, in that respect with the inventories, show what we have and, and therefore where the gaps are, hopefully towards improving the situation overall. Yeah, thank you, Vibhav. I think this relates to your comment in the chat about, um, especially since James mentioned the WMO, the importance of uh, uniformity of observations and of coverage. Um, and also Sergio pointed out the value of uh, getting input from local stakeholders, um, Geo Mountains, and perhaps James would like to share more, but is also doing a series of regional workshops, trying to solicit more of that input because it is very important. Sergio also mentioned the um, importance of climatic impact drivers and shared a link in the chat to the annex of the last IPCC report. So that's available for everyone to check out too. Um, any other questions, concerns, comments related to these points for anyone? Yes, I Okay, well, um, just to mention, I will also share in the chat Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, just to, just to mention that yeah, the survey provides um, opportunities for for any more inputs. Um, even if you don't necessarily agree, the concept is a is a useful way forward, and any feedback would be gratefully received. Thanks. Sorry, Gabrielle. Oh yeah, no, thank you. Um, I also shared the link to the next lecture in the series in the chat in case anyone would like to join. And as James mentioned, I will send everyone who registered, not just those who are present live, but I'll send everyone who registered a link to today's recording, today's slides to the survey. So you'll have plenty of opportunities to contribute and to share the opportunities to contribute. Um, 
thank you, James, for sharing. And thank you all so much for coming. It's great to have you as part of the series. Yeah, thank you, Gabrielle. And thanks again, everybody, for the engagement. Uh, much appreciated. And look forward to working with uh, many of you in the future towards um, improving all these aspects.